Welcome to Online Offscript, where we discuss trending topics and all things new on the internet. I'm Sam Olmsted, Online Optimism's New Orleans Managing Director. And I'm Mira McNitt, the Social Media Director. This week, we are talking about social media for community justice. Our guest today is SJ Walker, Communications Manager at Conway Strategic. Prior to joining Conway Strategic in 2022, SJ worked as the Digital Communications Manager and Social Media Manager at the Louisiana Center for Children's Rights, Content Coordinator at Perk Social Media, and a Social Media Specialist here at Online Optimism. All right. Thanks for joining us, SJ. How are you? I'm good. How are y'all? We're good. I'm doing great. Um, All right. Let's just jump right into it. Um, So can, can you start by telling us how you got into social media for community justice? Yeah, so I got into social media specifically um, through the online optimism online optimism specialist program. Um, I was working in like just general marketing and doing a lot of like um, putting together brochures and stuff like that. Um, but I had a film degree from the University of Louisiana in Lafayette, and I was running my own photography business. And I really wanted to learn like the digital media, social media side of stuff. Um, so I quit my full time job, did the specialist program. I think everyone thought I had like lost my mind, um, but I really liked it. It was super great. Um, shameless plug. Anyone wants to learn, I recommend it to everyone I know. Um, And then from there, I mean, I felt super equipped to then start doing social media, ended the specialist program, got a job with a smaller agency, um, doing social media management. Um, And then after about a year or so there, got the job with the Louisiana Center for Children's Rights, um, which was, I mean, just an immediate jump into like community justice, nonprofit, criminal legal system space. Um, So that was a lot of learning, um, like books and webinars and just learning from, I mean, it was a bunch of attorneys that worked there. So like learning how the legal system works and learning how, um, like what you can post and what you can't post is really different when the court is involved. Um, And so that kind of all snowballed into what I do now is, which a bigger firm that kind of specializes in a range of things related to nonprofit justice work. So your marketing career came first and your interest in social media marketing um, design and everything like that came first. And then your interest in community justice came along with that as you stepped into different roles and different um, spaces in your career. Is that right? Yeah. I mean, I think I was always pretty civic minded. Um, My grandmother is super civic minded, like in the League of Women Voters. And I was registered to vote before I turned 18 because you can technically register six months before the election that you're able to vote in before you turn 18. Uh, So I grew up kind of like around that um, and very hyper aware of um, me being Black in America, being a woman in America and how like all those things intersect. Um, And then even at college, starting... um, Fun fact about me, I started UL's uh, first Black Student Union. So we they didn't have one on campus. Um, so any org um, that was uh, mainly a Black-led org, you had to have a GPA requirement to join, and it was an application process. There was no org for Black students that they could just be a part of without any steps really to join. Um, and UL had a really low Black student retention rate. So to combat that, we started the Black Student Union. So I think just um, social media for like justice and community justice, I think really combines and meshes really well, like everything I'm kind of interested in. So it's a nice way, though sometimes a bit taxing to just kind of be able to touch point all of my interest. Yeah. Do you ever feel burnt out that two of your like strongest interests are things that you have that you spend your nine to five doing? Yes. (laughs) All the time. Um, Part of my resolution this year is to get more hobbies um, so that I'm not constantly doing work. It's super easy to feel like I am always working, Um, especially I think like when you're the friend that knows about all this stuff too, right? Because then it turns into like people just like 
conversations turn into like, well, what's going on with this? Like, you know, what's happening with like the crime in New Orleans? Like, I know, you know, tell me what's really going on. And it's like, I just wanted to get dinner and drinks, you know, um, I didn't want to break down data points for you tonight, but I will. Uh, so definitely, I think it's super easy to get burnt out. I think you have to work really hard to like center yourself and make sure you're not um, exhausting yourself. Yeah. It's- and to that point, sorry. I was just going to say, do you have fun? Do you still have fun on social media? Do you still enjoy social media as a place for fun? Yeah, I think um, so. Part of what I try to do, too, is like not um, in like doing social media for community justice. I'll use um, LCCR, the Louisiana Center for Children's Rights, as an example, Um, like trying to post the positives about what's going on. Um, Everyone knows or, you know, things like crime right now in New Orleans is a huge problem, right? Like we don't need to get online and like reiterate that. What we can talk about is like what improvements we're seeing and like what like what good stuff is happening. Um, they recently did a partnership with some of um, the children um, who are in like community programs and some who are in um, JJIC, which is children who are incarcerated. Um, where they paired them with an artist and they put together art that like talked about their experience. Um, and some of it is, was like really sad to hear their stories, but like the end result was like these beautiful pieces of art done with like professional artists that have a name with these kids on them. The exhibit is at like the Newcomb Center. It's like beautiful to see. It's like fun to be there. The topics aren't necessarily fun, but you know, like the outcome was like a happy outcome. So I think I try to focus on that type of stuff on social. I think um, as y'all know, social media can be super negative if you let it, even if you're not doing community justice stuff, there's just a cesspool out there. So I just try to really, um, be able to tie in like fun trends. I don't like to use the word trends, but like make it still like fun social to be on. I don't want to be on there, like giving a speech every day, like stop putting people in jail. Like I want to still be able to tweet a meme every now and then. Yeah. I mean, like, I feel like social media used to be this almost, like, superficial space. People just saw it as, like, an escapist zone, but it's clearly turned into a, like, communication platform and a, like, awareness platform. How how has that change happened? Because I feel like you were kind of doing this work. You were in this before 2020. So I feel like for most people, that's, like, the timeline started for them. But obviously, like, people were doing awareness before then. But can you just give us kind of like a gloss over of like how you see social media has changed from like just fun to actual like conversations about this? Yeah, I think um, social media was like always kind of a town square, right? Like everyone was just kind of on there doing their own things. Um, And I think in the last, I would say like five or so years, it's definitely grown to more of like the conversations that are happening in that square, are like much more based in reality. Um, I think due to like a number of things, I think the pandemic was a big shift because everyone was at home. And so what was there to do? Like you had to get on social media if you wanted to connect with people, right? Like that was the way that people were connecting. So I think the conversations that you might have, um, like with your coworkers or with your family, when you guys had like Sunday dinner and that's when you talk about like the upcoming election or that's when you talk about like, Hey, did you hear, um, you know, the police did this and that's crazy. Like those in-person conversations just shifted to online and they never left. Um, and I think it's been super impactful because um, now a lot of people are privy to those conversations. They weren't privy to those conversations before, right? I think with a lot of like the community justice and criminal justice conversations, it was people that knew about those spaces, having those conversations with other people in those spaces, which was really limiting Um, If only lawyers are talking about the flaws in the criminal justice system or only activists are talking to activists about what they can do to talk to the lawyers, you know. So I think it's definitely bridged a lot of gaps Um, in good ways and bad ways. I think it also makes everybody think that they're an expert. Um, I say all the time, like social media is causing like the loss of the concept of an expert because everyone thinks that they know something in its entirety because they saw a snippet of it on social media. But I think overall, um, it opened up a bunch of communication channels. I mean, why would you not want to reach as many people as possible, you know, without even having to get up out of your bed? 
Can I make a hot take? Yes. I I think one of the I just thought of this. I feel like one of the main drivers of like social media being this like town square where people are like it's going outside of individual circles and the conversations are getting broader. I think it was the introduction of sharing Instagram posts to stories. Because I feel like that's how so much gets spread. And beforehand, like, you had to be following the account and you kind of just had to know it. You had to see it. You had to already know it existed to even lay eyes on their content. And now I think you're right. Because I think that also spearheaded, like, other platforms then being able to share. Like, the sharing on platforms now. I mean, originally I want to say, like, you could really only reshare on, what, Twitter and Tumblr. Like, that was just kind of, like, those were the platforms that did that. And now every platform has, you can reshare. Even on TikTok, you can repost someone's TikTok and it'll just show up on people's feeds. I don't even know how that works in their algorithm, but you can repost a TikTok that it doesn't show up on your like actual feed on your page, but it will show up when someone's scrolling that you've reposted it. Well, you could DM posts to other people, right? Before you could share it on their stories, right? But it wasn't as saying like, you weren't saying, okay, this is, a take that I've seen that I'm going to share with my whole network. Um, it was just, Hey, did you see this one little meme? Yeah. You could send it to like your one friend, like, yeah, look at this. Yeah. But I I like, I I, I do see a lot of that. Once we got to that point where we could do that, like I'm, I'm a big sharer of the things to my stories and it it was so easy. Yeah. And it made, it made me like an ex, an accessible person. So like someone that I went to high school with, he DM me and he was like, Hey, this is weird, but can you like explain to me the difference between like appropriation and appreciation? Like I, I keep seeing that, but I don't really get it. And it's like, because he saw me sharing those graphics and like those were getting into his field where I was like he, other people he follows might not have put that into his awareness. He one, like saw that and was starting to like understand that there's something there. And two was able to be like, okay, I can identify someone that I know and have contact with who I feel comfortable talking to as opposed to like, if you follow these accounts, there are plenty of times where like these educators, like someone comments a question and then their followers just like dogpile on that question that could have been asked in total good faith. And so then people get scared. So it's nice that we like not only can share it to our stories, but then also have this like private communication system that you can then like deepen the conversation with someone. It it creates a space to ask questions, which I think is really important, um, especially in this space, because there is just so much um, that you don't know. When I took the job with LCCR, it was very much like a mission space. Like I was like, I know I can do the social digital stuff. Like I have that. And it was like, I also know that like, I don't think that children should be incarcerated. Like, I don't think we should put children in jail, right? Like to me, that's just a value. So like, yeah, the job makes perfect sense. Like, let's do it. And then getting there and learning about like how that happens, like not even just like systemically, like what steps have to happen in a child's life for them to end up in a situation to go to jail, but just like the actual like legal step-by-step process that happens for like a child to be put in jail It was just like, there was no way I would have learned that just existing, you know, going through my normal life. So I think it makes it very comfortable in a very safe space. Like he identified you as somewhat of an expert, right? And then felt comfortable like coming to you and asking you and knowing that what you would tell him he could take and apply. Yeah. Yeah. It's just interesting, like how it facilitates, it's like a catalyst for spreading information and then also like bringing it back home and like having those one-to-one conversations. Oh, okay. I think we should move on to the next question. Um, so this one's a doozy, but you agreed to it. <laughs> um, what impact has Black Lives Matter had on social media for criminal justice? Oh yeah. I really liked this question um, when I saw it on the list. So I don't think that we've seen the full impact yet. First of all, I want to preface, um, I think that it feels like we've seen like a really strong full impact because for a lot of people, what they're seeing with Black Lives Matter is like shocking new information. But for a huge segment of this country, it's like very old news to us. We're not like shocked and surprised um, by the videos or by the content or by what we see, right? So I think it's kind of a twofold thing. Um, 
I think it educated a ton of non-Black people on the lived realities that Black people face from the police, from the criminal justice system, from the legal system, from the white women in the park, from, you know, like all of these things that happen on like a very daily basis that seem super rare. And that if you were like talking to someone, like to call back to the first question, if you were just like talking to someone at your job, they'd be like, yeah, but what are the odds that that happens, you know, all the time? And it's like, but then you can get online and see that it's happening every single day, right? So I think it definitely made that super clear. Um, But on the flip side, I think that it also brought up and highlighted how often people are not believed um, in real life and online when these things happen. I mean, how often do we see under the videos where people are like, okay, but what, like, where's the first 30 seconds of the video, you know, Um, or where's the end of the video or what happened first, or we don't know what, you know, and it's like this, like, state of disbelief that I think feels super specific to the internet, but that happens in real life too, right? Like people, cases get thrown out because the the actual victim, which is, you know, the black person in the situation isn't believed because we have like this inherent trust in the criminal legal system that maybe isn't always, you know, right on target. So I think the impact of it is twofold in that we also see pressure. Like there's now, you're not able to put like this massive amount of public pressure on elected officials, on police chiefs, on specific officers when they release their names and stuff. And then you have 200,000 people who are like calling that police station, you know, like, is he, does he still work there? We need to know, let us know, Um, which is a form of protest that before you had to get out of your bed to go protest. You had to, you know, know someone personally that was doing the protest to inform you that it was happening to get there. And now it all happens online. So I think that is maybe the biggest change or the impact. Um, And then also the way that we've seen it spark up like for other communities, which I think is great, like hashtag stop Asian hate and stuff like that, where it's like now these other marginalized groups see the power of like your voice on the internet and are using it for their um, own well-being as well. I have kind of an interesting question about this. So I'm not sure which organization you were with at the time of like the, the heaviest part of the Black Lives Matter movement, but did you see like an influx of followers, the accounts that you were managing and then a drop off of engagement or followers? Like, did it, did it feel like there was like a, in the moment, like, yeah, we're all in. And then like a couple months later, people are like, I don't, I don't, I don't super care about following this anymore. (laughs) Yeah. I call it the black square effect. Um, everyone was like super pumped up to post their black square to show that black lives matter or like their blackout date. Um, which like what ended up happening with that, right. was like, then actual black voices got shoved down to the bottom because a bunch of non-black people were just posting this nothing, like literally just the square of nothing to show their support, which in turn drowned out the people that needed to speak. Um, And so I think that is something that happens. Um, I think with everything, I, I definitely saw it where people were like super ready to be engaged and like everyone was eager to be an activist because this is awful and terrible and we're going to change the world. Um, I think then people realize like it's a super heavy lift and it's taxing. And I think if you're in the community that's not directly impacted by it, it's super easy to be like, well, I don't want to do that anymore. Right. Because it doesn't actually affect your day to day life. So it's super easy to just be like, well, that was like a nice, like I, I did my part, right? Like I followed the page. I agree with what they're saying. That's all my lift is. Like, what am I yeah, supposed following, to do? Following is, is the easiest thing you could possibly do, right? Possibly <laughs> do. It's the, it's not even uh, the bare it's minimum. Nothing. It's, yeah. Yeah. It's, um, but it makes people feel good. And I think similar uh, to what Mira was saying, like now that you can share, right? Like you're like, well, I shared it to my story. Exactly. Like, yeah people saw it like that's all I needed to do um and then definitely saw a drop off like in a few months of like um and just like also people like unfollowing which isn't I laugh but it's like not funny but it's just kind of like seriously yeah. <laughs> like you're that you're that uninterested now that you're like actually just not even gonna follow the page anymore like don't even want to see it like gone with did it did you like so, go into your reports with like yeah we lost 100 followers this month uh 
It wasn't anything we did. They just decided they were done being anti-racist. Yeah, I'm like, it's. I mean, it was a conversation of like, how do we flag this as like racism? Like in the like explaining like the data of numbers, like the explanation for why this is happening is like internalized racism. Like that's just the note on the thing. Like, you know, um, the proper, you know, thing is like uh, fatigue, right? Like, yeah, uh, like mission driven, you know, fatigue. People just get tired of having to care about other people it makes people tired um but yeah like definitely having to explain those numbers and having to explain like the super big surge right that's always like kind of shitty to have to put in like a monthly report of like here's last year's last month's report where the numbers were off the charts it was crazy it was amazing we got 500 followers the engagement was crazy like all this stuff and then the next month it's like actually we lost more than we gained because like people just got tired of it we went through something similar when in like March and April of 2020 with COVID and we were working with like healthcare centers. So they were having to publish a lot of information. So like our numbers were off the chart and we were like, I mean, I'm not really happy these numbers are off the chart because it means something really bad is happening. Uh, yeah. Um, but then for like two years, we were having to be like, yeah, our engagement's down from the best that it was. But it's like, we're there was a worldwide pandemic. <laughs> like, yeah. You can't you know, compare us to that. It, so yeah, it's it's yeah. very it's very tricky. And when outside forces kind of like impact the, the campaigns that you're running, um, you know, it's not always a good thing. I mean, um, it could be anything, uh, but you don't want to necessarily see that spike in engagement for sure. It's, um, it's, it's scary. Sometimes it's scary. Yeah, because you're like, what's what's happening? What's causing this? Um, that is why I think it's super important for like nonprofit orgs and especially those in like the criminal justice space, I, I look at it through a lens of like, we're not necessarily trying to like get a ton of followers. We're not trying to like get a ton of engagement. Like we're really trying to build like an online community of people that care about this thing because we need people to like be in it for the long haul and we need them to stick around. Like, so we don't necessarily need um, 60,000 followers. It would be great to have that. But what we need is like a solid amount of people that will show up continuously every time um, and then just honestly put their money where their mouth is and donate money so that we can function and, you know, still be able to do things actually in the real world, in the community. And when you yeah. do that, when you're trying to build this online community, what is the unifying messaging that you create to build that online community? I think that Black Lives Matter, for example, was such a great, succinct, you know, getting to the point of like Black Lives Matter this is what we need to do. These are the things that we can do in terms of next steps. But at the base of it all, it's our lives matter. And that's what we're trying to say um, in terms of the messaging. Uh, do you have that same type of thing? I see a lot of hashtags, for example, for like criminal justice reform, um, you know, and gun violence, things like that, things that are about community safety or, um, or things in that realm. Do you have something similar or what, what is your unifying messaging? Yeah, so I think um, with the Louisiana Center for Children's Rights specifically, um, it's just leading with like the values that um, we hope everyone in the community shares, right? Which is like hashtag treat kids like kids, um, which is like we all want the children that are around us to be like cared for and taken care of and educated and respected and able to act like the children that they are. Um, which I think is like a very good way to unify um, like what the core message is, which is like kids can't be treated like kids if they're in jail, right? So I think definitely like how you said, like summing up just like what is the baseline value that we have, right? It would be super easy. Um, and I mean, sometimes we do. Sometimes the messaging is like, don't put kids in jail. Like that is like just the direct, like that's, you know, how we have to say it. But I think sometimes it is easier for people to kind of grasp on and like fully understand what the mission is when we're like leading with the values that we just like should share as a society, which is like, we should treat kids like kids and we should, you know, um, not be violent with people from people that are expected to protect us. And just kind of like that, like bottom line values of like, this is how like a society should be acting. I think it's super important to lead with. Um, and of course it's nice when stuff can be like bundled up into a hashtag always. I think that's a great slogan also because it doesn't say anything about jail. It's implied that treating kids like kids 
would of course be something that does not include the the prison system, you know? Exactly. So, um, and, and it also doesn't speak to any specific audience except parents who also know that they don't want their kids in jail. So, um, I think that's a, a great answer that I wasn't really ready for. So thank you. I'm coming in with another hot take. All right. Okay. Ready? I feel like slogans like that are great because you say it to someone and it's very hard for them to disagree. Like no one's gonna be like, no, don't treat kids like kids. They're gonna be like, Oh, why don't you like that? But I think that's yeah. also part of the reason some of these dangerous social media movements have caught steam like QAnon, where it's like, save the children. Like I had to contact one of my family members when that was really catching on and be like, listen, you're going to see these posts on Facebook and they say, save the children and they're anti-child trafficking, all this. And it's like, yes, a hundred percent, but that is not actually what they're doing. And like, I'm going to, I'm going to break this down for you about what this actually means. And they were like, why did you know that? I'm like, well, because I pay attention, but if you're only using Facebook, you're not getting the full breadth of information that I've been seeing by watching this go down on Twitter and all these other spaces. Um, so I think that there's like almost a danger to the like catchiness of the simplification of social media. And we also see that in like passive headlines and stuff like that. Those are very good about blaming the victim and just omitting that there was a villain at all in whatever they're talking about what happened. But I'm going to, I'm going to phrase this into a question. I'm going to go directly from my hot take into, so okay. Ashley, I want to hear what you think are the dangers or negative impacts of social media on criminal justice specifically. Well, I think, um, one, your hot take sparked a thought in my head, which is like, it's the thin line of, I think, in our line of work of like, do we assume that people have media literacy skills or not? Yeah. Right. Which is like, uh, it's like, like, we, we hope that they no. do. And I think, <laughs> well, yeah. <laughs> but I think it's like hard because it's like people know how to, um, and with like the sudden growth of social into this space, right? Like people, for the most part, know how to consume um i'm being generous here but like they know how to consume the news right they know that like your news channel that you watch is going to be more aligned to what you want to see because you're choosing to watch the news channel that you're choosing to watch the same with your paper right like the paper that you pick up to read you know what's going to be in it you're choosing to read it and with social media where things can be put in front of you that you are not choosing necessarily to engage with or see they're just being yeah. placed in front of you for your consumption um i think it's a harder literacy skill to build to know how to engage with it right because how deep do you look to see um what something is right because you could read one article about it that just says like save the children you know children shouldn't be trafficked like Mary said of course i don't think that and then you read deeper into it and you realize like that's not actually what they're talking about at all right like it's just kind of like a like it's a it's a misdirect, right? Like it's just kind of like yeah. there's more to it than that. Um, I think was the question: What are the dangers of social media? In <laughs> yeah, this? like Sorry, how I'm like a tangent? No, it was a great tangent. But like, what are the dangers or negative impacts of social media, either on criminal justice or in tandem with criminal justice? I think. In a few different ways, right? Like I said, it, it primes everyone to be an expert. So then you don't listen to the experts because, um, and Mira, I think you're an expert on a lot of things, but like to bring up your example of your high school friend, like messaging you, right? Like if you weren't, if you didn't know what you were talking about, right? But you had given him an answer, would he have still like held on to that answer and just right. like accepted it as fact and like not ever been able to change his mind? You know, like it creates stuff like that. Um I think social media with all things, it makes it super easy for people to jump to conclusions, you know, negative and positively. But I think um, on my end, I try to be really careful with what like I'm putting out there, right? Like I don't want people to see a post that we make about like what the city government is doing and run and use that to form an opinion about a specific official. Like that's not necessarily what we're talking about, right? You know, so I think it's dangerous in the way that like, it's super complex to understand how things are being posted. Everyone is engaging with social media differently. So everyone's perception and context, context for what they're reading is different. Um, so me, I use social media super seriously. I'm on there talking about like real life shit. Can I curse on here? I'm yeah. on there talking about real life stuff. <laughs> and it's like, 
So when I see things on social media, I have to check myself oftentimes and be like, this is probably a joke. They're probably like, ha ha ha, laughing at this. I'm reading it through like my serious, like life is hard and messed up right now and real things are happening and we should be like fixing things. But like this tweet is just a joke. I have to like check myself with that, right? So I think it happens in reverse the other way too, where people are like on there for shits and giggles. They're like, social media isn't real. It's just social media. Ha 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 ha. And then not factoring that there is like real life implications to the stuff on social media. Right. So I think, um, with the, even posting the videos of like, um, how we, we know now, like we see videos of people being killed, like by police officers, right? Like that's just like the norm for those to be released now and put on social media. And with the case that just happened where my timeline was filled with people giving instructions on how to not watch that video if you didn't want to watch that video because the norm is that the video is going to pop up on your timeline, right? Like that's just what's expected. We probably, that shouldn't be the norm. We shouldn't be able to like hop on Twitter and see that video. Um, So I think there's dangers to people's mental health. I think there's dangers to the way that we engage with public officials. Um, I see all the time in New Orleans specifically, people are really upset with the city. They're on social media. They are full of comments and good opinions and strong opinions on what's happening in the city. But also for my job, I watch a lot of the city council meetings. Not a lot of people are watching those, right? Not a lot of people are engaging with those. And it's like, well, that's where we actually like need to be. Like, I think people assume social media is a way bigger part of the process for criminal legal stuff than it is. And it's like, it's not. I mean, it's a good way to get the initial message out there. But, and I think I think social media and media itself, like people have the same illiteracy in terms of how to consume it um, in the same way that people don't quite understand how to consume social media. They don't know how to consume traditional media. They read headlines and that's it. And then they post those headlines onto social media. And I used to be super yeah. critical of people um, with no social media literacy, because I'm deep in the weeds in social media. I've got five Instagram accounts, way too many, but that's just the way it is. And, um, and I realized, and this is just going off on a little bit of a tangent here, but I realized in looking at my paper mail that I was receiving junk mail and straight up did not know it was junk mail. I was <laughs> looking at, I was like, is this a bill? Like, do I owe someone something? Is this a medical bill? I couldn't understand it. And I was like, this is what grandmas and grandpas feel when they look at social media. They're the same way. They're like, is this real? Um, Do I need to take action? What children do I need to save? Uh, You know, and and they get really confused. Who has the children? They are like. (laughs) Exactly. Like Pizzagate, like it's in somebody's pizza parlor. And so, you know, I think it's sort of that flip and reverse of just recognizing that people just don't understand. But. Also, people aren't making it easy. So I don't know if either of you are aware, but on TikTok, there's this thing right now where Gen Z specifically are using the word mascara. Is that what you're thinking of? They're using the word mascara to take the place of another word that they believe the TikTok algorithm is censoring. Part of the problem is that, like, I don't think anyone's consistently using the word mascara to censor the same word. So some people are using it in reference to consensual sex and boyfriends and relationships, and it's turned into sexual assault. Or it might have gone the other way around. I think it might have started with sexual assault, but now people, like, they weren't really getting, like, they were like, oh, it's about sex, and then they changed it into consensual sex. But it wasn't, like, a a global, no one sat down and was like, this is what we're going to use. It's not like on Tumblr where everyone's like, oh, shoelaces? That means Tumblr. Like, we all know. We all get it. This just happened in this, like, corner of TikTok. So now people, like, someone made a post about their mascara and a celebrity commented and was like, I don't get it. Like, I don't really feel bad for you right now. Yeah, what she said was, I don't really feel bad for you right now. Like, I think that was, like, verbatim what she commented, which was like... Oh, I froze. I mean, it was a weird comment in itself, but, but also like (laughs) if you just read the sentence, you have no idea what it means. Like, I think the guy's post, it said something like, um, 
a girl used my mascara one time and she liked it so much that her and her friend used it again without asking or like something like that. So if you know what the word is coded to mean, then you're like, oh, that's awful. I'm so sorry that happened to you. Right. Like, but if you have no idea what's going on, then you're like, oh, some girls, his girlfriend and her friend like used this mascara. Like, and if you're a girl, people use your mascara all the time. You know, like like your actual, not the coded word, like your actual right. mascara. Like people use it right. all the time. And so it was like this weird thing. And everyone, and we referenced like the dogpiling when you ask questions, like everyone kind of like dogpiled on her for like being so insensitive and like, oh, you don't care about this. Um, and I don't know if she knew, you know, what was going on or not. The comment was super crass. I'm assuming she did not. Um, but yeah, <laughs> it was saying. like, how is anyone supposed to know? Yeah, like I'm, and I'm a millennial, like right there. So it's like, even even me, when I first saw a mascara TikTok post, I was like, what? Yeah, same. Like I was in the comments. I, mean, I was if, in the comments. Like, what does this mean? <laughs> what is going on? If the three no of idea. us don't, if, if, if we don't get it, then I'm just going to say that like people are not going to get it like unmasked. You know what I mean? And so. so that's the thing is that like when you bring up Pizzagate, like this situation made me automatically think of Pizzagate because people were using pizza as a code word, but then other people weren't aware. So now all these celebrities are being accused of being child traffickers because they're talking that they like pizza, but everyone talks about pizza. About pizza. Everyone uses mascara. Like they're just using these very like innocuous common terms and it's just depleting the even the opportunity to have media literacy. Yeah. Yeah. And maybe that's the point, honestly, for the people that are trying to cloud social media and like kind of tamp down any sort of advocacy or actual progress. Who knows? I mean, like just a small, small percentage of trolls and bad actors can really impact the messaging and like what good, well-meaning people are trying to do. So just to tie it back to SJ's work, like it's tough, I'm sure, to really get that point across on a consistent basis and connect with an audience and build an audience um, online. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it's a ton of repetition. So that's, I'm just (laughs) like, I feel like I'm constantly repeating myself, but I think like we said, like that's the clearest way, right? Like I'm like, if I shift the messaging, like we use treat kids like kids, right? If I shift to saying something else, I have to worry about like, is there now confusion in that? Right. Like if I shift to saying like, keep kids in our communities, do, do people process that as meaning the same thing? Like, will they know that right. this is like connected in the same thing? Um, and then, yeah, I, I try not the kids to get are moving. like, exactly. You'd be like, where are they sending the kids? Like, why do they need, right. you know, like what's going on? Um, and I try not to get into my like conspiracy theory bag a lot, but I do feel like a lot of this is like, you, you can't build media literacy if people are constantly changing the language, right? Like you cannot learn a language that is constantly, constantly changing. Um, yeah. Even us, we all work in this space. Like, how often are we just having to relearn how the same platforms work? You know, looking at you, Meta, like constantly changing your buttons and where things go. Like, you can't yeah. learn it. Like, you're constantly having to catch up. So, if you're not on TikTok, um, and then you see a TikTok like reshared to someone's Instagram about mascara, like you have no idea what's happening at all. Like there's no concept like you there's not even a framework for you to like try to piece together what's happening you have to read it at face value and it's i mean it can cause a ton of miscommunication yep okay we are over on time thank you i wish we could keep going but our producer is saying wrap it up (laughs) (laughs) all right sam do you want to go into the oh yeah absolutely esther any um anything you want to plug anything you want to promote um anything you want to share with the with the audience here yeah, I plugged it in the beginning, but I'm going to plug it again. Um, please head to the Newcomb Art Center and check out the pieces made um, in collaboration with the Louisiana for Children's Rights, um, Ubuntu Village, um, a whole bunch of orgs in the city were involved. Um, a ton of kids were involved. It's some really amazing art pieces. And then also you can learn more about me, my work. Um, I still do a little bit of photography, all of that on my website, thethesjwalker.com. Amazing. Well, Thank you perfect. so much, SJ. I had so much fun in this conversation. Good. I'm glad. Thanks for joining us today. Be sure to subscribe and rate the podcast. And if there's anything you'd like to hear us discuss, reach out on Instagram, Facebook, or LinkedIn. And as always, stay optimistic. <laughs>